It's a pleasure to welcome here uh, Dr. Markus Baudas uh, from European Space Agency. Uh, he's working for uh, European Space Agency for 28 years, uh, and he's head of technology preparation section in future missions department. Uh, he's a physicist, expert in uh, aerospace engineering and X-ray optics. Today I learned that in his private time, for fun, he builds his own telescopes and planes. Uh, he's a Slovenian, born in Brazil, and he speaks, nevertheless, he speaks uh, Slovenian uh, very well. Uh, and I would think that he's uh, hi the highest ranking Slovenian in the European Space Agency. And today he will tell us uh, about uh, European uh, involvement and contributions to space exploration. So, please. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, is the sound okay or is it a bit too loud? It's okay? Okay, I would like to give you uh, a short insight of uh, exploration of space by Europe. <coughs> Many people think, of course, first of NASA if you talk about space, but I think it's very important that we as Europeans are aware of the fact that we are also contributing to this exploration in a very active role. What we see here is uh, an image of uh, the Eagle Nebula. Uh, this is basically a cold gas where young stars are born. It's about 1,000 light years away. So what we see here is light that traveled 7,000 years to reach us. And this image was taken by the largest space telescope, uh, Herschel. And it shows basically in red cold areas of about 10 Kelvin, so 10 degrees above the absolute zero, up to about 40 Kelvin, which I indicated in blue. And these areas here, for example, are where new stars are being born. This is the telescope. So everybody has heard probably of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the optics of the Hubble Telescope is less than two and a half meters in diameter. This is a three and a half meter diameter telescope. So it's a significantly larger, has an area of twice as large as the Hubble Space Telescope. In addition, this is a cold telescope. So this whole telescope here is passively cooled to about 80 Kelvin, 80 degrees above absolute zero. This is almost 200 degrees below zero. Effectively, air would be liquid at that temperature. In addition, it carries with it 2,300 liters of liquid helium to be able to cool the detector instruments, which have to be operated at temperatures down to 100 millikelvin, 0.1 degree above the absolute zero. This telescope operated in an excellent way. Uh, it has already completed its life, uh, but it was made possible by the introduction of a new technology for making optics. If we would have used the same technology as for the Hubble Space Telescope, then the telescope would be just be far too heavy, and we could not have built a three and a half meter diameter mirror. So, at the European Space Agency, we have developed a new material to build such optics, and this is the silicon carbide. This is a ceramics material, and it's a very high quality, very uniform material, which, however, requires quite complex equipment to make it. And since it would be too expensive to make a machine to make this three and a half meter mirror in one piece, we had to develop also technologies to actually make this telescope in smaller segments and then to brace them together. The telescope is named after uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel. He, in fact, was the first to produce really large telescopes. He was also an explorer of the universe, and he wanted to basically see the dark, small clouds that you can see on the sky, which are basically remote galaxies, as we know today. And for that, he had to build his own telescope, because also, in his case, 
the current technology was not good enough to do the job he had to do. So he developed this mirror technology himself and built basically a mirror of 1.2 meter diameter uh, with which he could then, for example, discover Uranus and also basically catalog uh, a lot of uh, nebulosities on the sky. William Herschel also discovered that light is not only limited to the colors we can see. What he has done is that he has taken so sunlight and brought it through a prism to split it up in the colors. And he basically wanted to measure the intensity of the radiation if you go through the colors. And he used a simple thermometer to do that. Of course, if it's illuminated, the temperature rises. What he discovered is that when he moved the thermometer to the dark side beyond red, he saw that the temperature actually kept rising. So there must have been radiation, and thus he discovered infrared light. As we know today, we can only see a very small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum with our eyes. It's actually one octave only between 400 and 800 nanometers. And below that, we have infrared, and then we go to the radio waves. On the other side, we have UV light, X-rays, gamma rays. So this is a huge range. This is a logarithmic scale of wavelengths of this radiation. And corresponding to this different wavelengths are temperatures. The reason we have to have the telescope of Herschel so cold is because it is intended to observe the space in infrared light. This is something we cannot do from ground. Uh, and therefore, we had to go to space. This is an image taken by that telescope of the Andromeda galaxy. This is our neighboring galaxy, very similar to ours consists of about 100 billion stars, so really a huge amount of stars. But if we observe it in the infrared light, we see where we have cold dust clouds. Effectively, these are the areas of the Andromeda galaxy where new stars are being born currently. If we make an image in the X-rays, the same galaxy looks very different, as you can see here. Here we are now observing matter at thousands, of, uh, at thousands to millions of degrees. Effectively, in the infrared, we are observing the few 10 Kelvin matter, and in X-rays, we observe matter at millions of degrees. This is effectively uh, the stars that have finished their life. These are black holes, neutron stars, and other objects which are highly compact and effectively uh, heat the gas surrounding them to very high temperatures. Temperatures close to basically what, or similar to what we see on, in the solar corona. To take such an image, which was also taken by an European telescope in space, we had to build also a dedicated telescope. And this is the XMM-Newton uh, telescope, which is still operating. It was launched in 1999, so it will really soon be uh, expanding its life, expected lifetime by factor 10. This is about the length of a, of a bus and uh, has the solar rays to provide it with power. And it contains three X-ray mirrors which produce images of the sky onto detectors on the other end. The detectors here are similar to the detectors you have in your phones or cameras. They are just optimized for different parameters. But the optics is really a novel development. And here you see one of these modules, 
It consists of 58 telescope mirrors stacked inside each other because you can reflect x-rays only under very shallow incidence. If you have a normal mirror, of course, the radiation will just be absorbed in the mirror. But if you have an, a gl glancing incidence of about half a degree or so, then the x-rays get reflected. In fact, get reflected twice in this optics for each of the imaging of the photons. For the optics, the visible optics, uh, basically it was Galileo who produced the first telescope, which was useful. And this was done in 1609. And it took 400 years to get to the best telescope we currently have, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. For X-rays, if this works, yeah. We also basically had a development, but this was about 10 times faster. In 40 years only, the optics, the first optics, which flew on Skylab, were developed to the largest optics we currently have in space, which is the XMM mirror. Both technologies, the visible technology and the X-ray technology, has improved the sensitivity by about a factor of 100 million times. So technology development is increasing in pace and allows us to explore the universe at an increasing in in sensitivity so we can see deeper in the universe and discover better what it's made of and how it's structured. We have to start now already, in fact, we have started to prepare the follow-on mission, which will replace XMM Newton. To do that, we will have to build a machine which will be much more sensitive than XMM is today. And we'll have to work on both the optic side and on the detector side. The optics, in particular, is a completely new development which Cannot, which will have to be much more performant than the optics you have seen for XMM Newton. This is one of the first modules we have produced for this optics. We have to cover an area of about three meters diameter, so it's the size of a small room, and no, not only this size of optics like for XMM. So we have to build up this optics of smaller units and we call this mirror modules, which are about the size of a Coca-Cola can. So it's about, say, uh, seven by seven centimeters and about 15 centimeters long. Since these optics modules are small, we can use small machines to build these optics. And another very important aspect is that we had to use technology development occurring for the general ground segment, and that is the use of silicon. This optics uses as its starting product the silicon wafers that are used to produce electronics for computers and for telephones, etc. Why do we have to go to space to do that? Why don't we do it from ground? Well. First of all, if you see here the atmosphere and its transmission, its transmissivity, then we can see that in the visible light, our atmosphere is actually transparent. This is the reason we can see the stars and we can see the sun and we have light outside. But if we go into the ultra ultraviolet or X-rays, the atmosphere is completely opaque. Basically, we could not observe the X-ray sky from ground. We have to go into space to stay above the Earth atmosphere. The same is true in the infrared. So the infrared we were talking about there for Herschel, you simply have to go to space as well. Well, how do we actually go into space? Um, if we just throw a stone, give it an energy, then it will fly up, but it will come down again. So we have to throw it with more energy. It will still come down. 
if we throw it with even more energy, then it will actually be almost in space for a, time, for, for a short time, but it will still come back to Earth. If we give it sufficient energy, a velocity of about 8 kilometers per second, then this stone will just continuously fall towards Earth, but just never reach the Earth, because the Earth simply curves away faster than the orbit itself. So effectively, you have to provide energy at the beginning, in the launch phase. And then, once you are in orbit, once you are in space and you have enough velocity, you just stay there. You don't need to do anything anymore. So what you need is therefore a strong launcher. But before developing rockets, mankind had first to understand how orbits work. And it is quite interesting to see how this is an evolutionary process, how basically we proceed in, in steps. Copernicus discovered that the Sun is in the middle of our planetary system and the Earth and the other planets go around it. He did not explain how the planets travel. This was done by Kepler a few decades later, who, with his uh, three laws, explained that uh, planets and comets, moons, etc., travel on ellipses, with uh, the sun or the planet, uh, in case of moons, is in one of the focal points. He also described what the relation is between the duration of uh, one uh, evolution and the radius of the distance uh, to the star. But Kepler, so Kepler explained how it travels, but he did not explain why it is like that, which forces keep uh, the planets in their orbits. That required, again, a few decades of further thinking, and this was then by, uh, Isaac Newton, who then explained that it is actually gravity which dictates how masses attract to each other, which is the force you need to compensate the centripetal force, uh, centrifugal force of the orbital motion. The, the Newton's law uh, and Kepler's law laws were actually valid for a very long time and no discrepancy was discovered in nature. Um, it was only later, it was end of the 18th century, uh, of the 1800s, the 19th century, that it was discovered that the Mercury orbit makes a precession which was different from what was expected from the perturbations of the other planets and the shape of the Sun. This was quite a significant deviation of a few 10 arc seconds uh, per century. And it required a further evolution which happened only in the last century by Albert Einstein and with his general relativity of theory uh, general relativity theory uh, that was able to explain this peculiar motion of the Mercury orbit. Now, why Mercury? Because Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, and effectively what Einstein explained is that gravity is actually formed by a distortion of space, or can be understood as a distortion of space, which means that light has to travel not a straight path, but a curved path. In fact, this <coughs> phenomenon was observed very clearly and had to be even considered in the navigation of spaceships, for example, here visiting uh, Saturn. And we will see more about this mission later. Well, the access to space is not that easy. The, you need quite a lot of energy. To achieve eight kilometers per second, uh, you need to accelerate a body quite in a strong way. In fact, the first successful uh, access to space was by a V2 rocket, which was, for example, used um, after the war uh, in uh, 1949 
to detect for the first time X-rays in space. Simple Geiger counters were mounted on the top of the rocket, and it was just launched vertically. And in fact, a V2 rocket was able to reach space about 120, 150 kilometers altitude. A few years later, dedicated very simple rockets, so unguided rockets, were used to do further studies of this radiation that were found in space. Uh, these were kind of research rockets, Aero-B. Uh, they are about 15 meters long. It's a two-stage rocket, so therefore it can go higher than the V2. Um, and it was used to, it, to try to measure X-rays reflected off the moon. The idea was that this radiation, the X-rays from the sun, would create fluorescence radiation from the moon, and one would try to observe that. So this rocket was launched, it was slowly rotating, and basically scanning the sky. And at the location of the moon, it was expected to see a hump, a maximum of the radiation. But this did not occur. The maximum of the radiation was actually offset by about 25 degrees. So effectively, this led to the dis to the discovery of SCOX-1. This is the brightest X-ray source on the sky, uh, and it is an object which is formed by a neutron star, a very dense star, which has a companion, a normal star, and this compact object sucks gas uh, into its gravity bell and heats up the gas to very high temperatures and basically produces two jets and we are looking into one of those and therefore basically we have a high intensity of x-rays. This object is about 60,000 times more luminous in x-rays alone than our sun in all the spectrum. So it's a very bright object. In fact Riccardo Giacconi got his Nobel Prize for the discovery of these uh, cosmic X-ray sources. A few years later, uh, satellites have been built to monitor the non-proliferation treaties. Basically, there was the USSR and the USA agreeing that they will no longer test nuclear weapons above the surface in the atmosphere. For that, satellites were built to monitor gamma rays from orbit. In fact, a nuclear detonation produces specific, uh, specific gamma rays that can be observed from there. And in fact, in 67, uh, two of these um, satellites observed a flash of gamma radiation but its signature, its spectrum and time characteristics did not correspond to what you would expect from a nuclear blast. So when it was declassified, uh, it was then actually uh, published that in fact these were kind of unknown sources, but they had to be on the sky. So basically you had something happening on the sky uh, which was very brief. These were flashes of uh, typically seconds only. And in fact, later on, it took a few ten years to be able to find out what these gamma ray bursts were. It was the Italian Dutch satellite uh, Bepo Sachs, which was a, common, a joint project where also the European Space Agency was involved. Uh, which was equipped with a wide-field camera looking at a large fraction of the sky and pointed instruments, uh, so high-resolution uh, instruments, that could be used autonomously. So the satellite discovered there was something happening and the satellite could then follow up observations very quickly with other telescopes. And it was through the observation of this satellite that it could be explained what this, um, these gamma ray bursts are. 
I myself was involved as well in that project. You see me here close to, this, uh, to the rocket where the satellite is encased behind this housing here. I'm standing in front of that part, of course, before the launch. Um, and inside here is SACS uh, being uh, launched from Cape Canaveral. What was discovered is that these nuclear, this basically uh, GRBs, the gamma ray bursts, are caused by very massive stars which initially burn uh, hydrogen into helium and then increasingly heavier elements start to burn in the center of the star. So uh, going to heavier elements um, from helium, you're burning carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, etc., until you finish with iron. Now, you cannot burn iron anymore. That means you cannot transform, gain energy by fusing iron. So all of a sudden, this star has exhausted its possibilities to generate power in its center. And what then happens is, is that it collapses. But due to the huge mass of this star, this collapse compresses the center so much that effectively a black hole is formed. And when this occurs, of course, this is a huge flash of energy. And since the temperatures are extremely high, you actually observe this in gamma rays. Effectively, these black holes are laboratories in space today. We can study material under extreme conditions. But there are also other phenomena which are, which are very interesting to be studied in space. And in fact, we have also simpler laboratories than black holes in space. And this is the Columbus Laboratory, which is orbiting the Earth now. And it was built by the European Space Agency in European industry and forms part of the International Space Station. There, for example, if you take a normal candle, which, which of course we all know burns like this on, on Earth, that same candle bursts like this on the space station in normal air conditions. The reason simply is that this candle can burn this way because here the gases burn, they get hot, and hot air raises up. And so it has time to burn, and fresh air is sucked in to continue burning. On the space station, the burning occurs but there is no differentiation between hot and cold. So the hot, the basically the burned gases just remain close to the candle and they cannot move away except by diffusion. And fresh air can only diffuse in there. So for that reason, it burns very differently. Now there are a lot, of more, lot more practical experiments one can do there, but you need a space station to do that. And in fact, we have here a Slovenian uh, who actually has contributed a lot to the modern uh, understanding of how we can reach space and how we can use it. This was Hermann Potocnik, who was more known under the pseudonym Hermann Nordung. And he basically published a book uh, on the problem of space travel. He basically already understood what you need to do to build a rocket to be able to reach space. And he also designed the first space station. It's actually quite a modern design. Uh, it's close to the design of, say, uh, the Odyssey 2001 uh, uh, space station, which is effectively in the form of a wheel, which turns so that it produces artificial gravity, so that humans can just live there in the normal way. Of course, at his time, solar cells were not known, so he had to invent and use, in fact, also still solar energy, but of course using effectively steam engines to produce uh, electricity. But the concept is correct. So I mean, that effectively is not so much different from the current space station. Well, this is how it looks like. Uh, it's a huge beast. I mean, it's really here uh, the size of a uh, of a football field. And you see here also, this is the, the European laboratory, the uh, 
that, that we have seen before. You have another laboratory from the Japanese. Uh, you have here a Russian uh, Soyuz capsule. You have here the Russian segment of the station. This is the American segment of the station. So basically, this is certainly an international space station. It is simply a huge project which would be too expensive for a single country to undertake. Even for NASA, it is just too large a burden to bear. And in fact, we Europeans have contributed to this station, not only with the uh, laboratory, but also by providing our launch vehicle, which is the Ariane 5 today, which is the most successful launcher on the commercial market. About more than 50% of all satellites worldwide are being launched by this type of rocket, which is built in Europe and launched from our launch center in South America. To give you an idea about the size of such a vehicle, it's about 60 meters tall. So this is basically 20 floors, 20 floors, quite a high building. And it has the weight of about a ship. It's about almost 1,000 tons, about 800 tons. In fact, here you see two satellites in this fairing. This basically the rocket ends here, the real rocket. And what is above it is basically the cargo area. How, how did actually Europe su succeed to do this? Well, it was very important to join forces, to work on this problem together. And it was already this, in 1960 that ELDA was formed, the European Launcher Development Organization. Because Europe, after the war, has started to develop technologies that could be used for, for example, telecommunication or observation of the Earth for weather monitoring, etc. So Europe could build a satellite, but it could launch one. So they went to the Americans and asked, well, could we launch? Could you launch a satellite for us? Well, they would launch it, but you would have to order the satellite in America. But this was not the idea. So Europe therefore decided, let's make our own. And soon thereafter, a second organization was formed, which is the European Space Research Organization, ESRO. And these two were soon merged into a single agency, uh, which exists still today. This is the European Space Agency. It is just important to coordinate all these activities, and this is what was recognized in, in a few years' time. Last year, Slovenia joined this club, uh, as an associated member, so it can now participate in the programs it elects to participate to. ESA, the European Space Agency, is uh, a civil organization and it is exclusively for peaceful purposes. So we do not do any defense or other projects like NASA. We are concentrating on the peaceful purposes and uses of space. ESA has bilateral agreements with the individual member states, and currently it has 22 member states, which you see depicted here in dark blue. Slovenia is an associated member, and basically what that means is that it does not participate to the mandatory program, uh, which is essentially the science program. It can select, for example, Earth observation, launchers, navigation, or other areas and put money in there. It, of course, can contribute to science missions, but it doesn't need to. All the other member states have agreed that they want to have science as a mandatory part. So the main center is located in the Netherlands. Uh, this is where also I work. I have my office right here, if you come and visit me, which is very close to the North Sea. Just this small blue triangle here is the North Sea. Well, these are sand dunes, and then, then is this center. About 2,500 people work here, mostly engineers, and basically it is here that 
say, the new rocket is being developed largely, uh, but also the satellite technologies. Uh, and we can test satellites in the test center we have here. What is the budget of ESA? Well, it is about almost 6 billion euros uh, for this year, which is divided into a number of areas. So, for example, a one of the largest fractions is navigation. This is the Galileo program, which will be the European GPS system. So, currently, of course, if we drive our cars, we are relying on the GPS system, which the Americans can switch off at any moment if they want it. The Galileo system will be available, of course, uh, under European control. Launchers, so this is also a very important part to ensure our access to space also in future. Earth observation, this is very important to, to keep all the possibilities open, to observe the Earth, see the development, global warming, all these type of things are covered here. And space science, this is about 9 or 10 percent of the total budget. Slovenia contributes about 3.4 million to this 5.7 billion. And with a population of about 500 million people in our member states, it means that every person puts about 11 euros on the table every year for this. For this and, and most of the programs here, except for the red one, are voluntary. I mean, each country just decides, I want to build a rocket or I want to build on the Galileo system and they pay for it because they have a financial return. I should say also that 90% of this money goes into the European industry. So it is not spent by ESA itself. It's spent by ESA, yes, but it is by a contract. So the money is actually paid to European industry and institutions as well. Uh, so research institutions, universities, etc., uh, to actually execute the work. ESA is coordinating everything and making sure that useful projects come out of this. Science, what I'm talking about today mainly, is funded to about 500 million for this year, which means that every member state uh, inhabitant pays about one euro per year. And with this one euro, basically we have a whole fleet of observatories in space. So we have LISA Pathfinder, of which you might have read about in the newspapers uh, this year. So basically it's preparing the observation of gravitational waves in space. We have Herschel that we have seen before. I will show you briefly a few things about Planck. We have the JWST, the Next Generation Space Telescope, Gaia, and a lot of other missions that are operating in space or will soon operate. All that with one euro per person per year. And we also have this independence, so we can, in fact, serve the market, and this actually brings revenue to Europe and help fund all these developments as well. And this is our launch center in French Guiana, and you see here the Ariane 5 launcher prepared for launching Herschel and Planck. This was in 2009. So the other passenger on this rocket uh, with Herschel was Planck. Planck is a very special satellite which produced the picture of the space of, of universe when it was very young. Basically, it is observing the cosmic background, which was which is basically the uh, visible uh, explosion at the start of the universe and diluted now by the dilution of the, of, of the universe with the expansion to cool down to microwave temperatures. Basically, it's looking back to the dawn of time, to the start of time. This is how it looks like. So uh, you see here an image taken by a previous mission, WMAP, and you see here how Planck increased the quality tremendously. And this helps us understand of how actually the universe was born. 
what you see here are effectively is a temperature map of, of the sky. And the differences between the blue and the red are only a millionth of a degree centigrade. So with this instrument, you can actually detect the heat of a rabbit on the moon. So it's a very sensitive thermometer. If we had here the Big Bang at the beginning, then we had an inflationary period where the size of the universe expanded. And this here, this surface, is what we are looking at. This graph shows you the time in this axis. So you have the Big Bang here, and today is here. There is 14 billion years from here to here. And in this time, basically, the universe expanded. So it became larger and larger, and it evolved. So here, at the beginning, at the, the time that is being observed by Planck, the universe was actually very uniform. It didn't have any stars, any planets. It was just radiation, large radiation, and particles, which were effectively ionized. And then, the temperature dropped here at 400,000 years after the Big Bang to a temperature where electrons could combine with protons, and the universe became transparent. But these were the dark ages, because basically there were no stars. The matter did not yet have time to organize it itself into, into stars. The first stars show up about 400 million years later, and then the, these stars basically organize themselves into galaxies, like the Andromeda galaxy we have seen before. This discovery of how, this, how space and uni the universe works also requires additional measurements we can, which we can do on the Earth, on, on the ground. And one of the most important centers for this is the CERN facility in uh, Switzerland and France. This is, as you know, probably a 30-kilometer long tunnel uh, under the uh, Swiss Jura Mountains. And it is a huge, uh, basically, vacuum facility uh, with this several uh, pipes going around this circumference of 30 kilometers to basically accelerate particles and let them collide at given positions. And the detoc detectors they use are much larger than the detectors we use, of course, in space. You, say, you see here a human for comparison. So these are facilities which are enormous and very complicated as well, and they complement what we are measuring in space. All these discoveries of what we are doing in space and what we are doing underground, this is about 100 meters underground, basically opened up windows to understand how the world works, which we didn't even dream of uh, a few decades ago. In fact, with this facility, um, basically the Higgs boson was discovered a few years ago, and with the, with the detector you have seen before, you actually track individual particles that are generated when you have two protons colliding. What we're trying to understand is what the universe is made of. So if we start with heavy elements, like the material we are made of, so anything that is heavier than, than hydrogen and helium, then this forms only about a tiny fraction of 1% of the mass of the universe. A large fraction of the mass, comparatively to the heavy elements, are stars. This is mainly hydrogen and helium, but even those, even together with the neutrinos, is less than 1% of the mass of the universe. 4%, so four times as much, is actually free hydrogen and helium. That is matter which is just between the stars and between the galaxies. But the, the largest fraction is something we call dark matter, but we don't know yet what it is. And an even larger fraction, 
It's something we call dark energy, and we know even less about that. We only th think we know is that this dark energy is what is needed to explain why the universe is actually start to, starting to expand at a higher rate. Initially, the universe expanded and the expansion rate was slowing down. Like a stone you throw up, after a while it will go slower. But what we discovered is that the universe, uh, a few billion years ago, actually started to accelerate in the expansion. So if would an allergen begin with a stone, we throw it up, it goes up and then slower and slower, and all of a sudden it starts to go up higher, faster and faster. This is how we know the universe currently expands. And that accelerated expansion is attributed to this dark energy. So we're trying to explore what that is. And in fact, we are currently preparing a mission to look at the dark matter. Now, this is the Euclid mission, which is expected to be launched in 2020. It's a very special telescope which will look at shapes of, of uh, galaxies uh, very far away and will determine their shape and their spectrum. With the spectrum, we will know the distance, and with the shape, we will be able to detect effectively lensing by dark matter which is not visible to us, it's dark matter, it means, so the name comes from the fact that it doesn't interact with photons, with electromagnetic radiation, so we cannot see it. Uh, but it shows gravity, so we can see its effects on gravity. Okay, but we don't only have telescopes. With a one euro per year per inhabitant, we also build these. So, or are building these. So, SOHO cluster is studying the sun. We visited Venus. Uh, we are observing the Earth. Uh, we are preparing a mission to visit Jupiter. We, we have a mission orbiting Mars. Um, we have landed on uh, the moon of Saturn. We have Rosetta uh, cluster observing the magnetosphere of the Earth, and so on. One example here would be the Cassini-Huygens mission. Uh, this is a joint mission with NASA. NASA built the Cassini uh, orbiter, and Europe built the Huygens lander. The, this is this part attached here. And you see it here in our test center at ESTEC in Holland. So this is effectively a probe which was able to decelerate in the atmosphere of the moon Titan and land on this moon. You see here an artist's impression of how it looked like. This was uh, in January of 2005. Basically, this probe was released uh, uh, by the orbiter and then penetrated the atmosphere and landed on parachutes. This, was, this is a sequence of pictures taken uh, during the descent. And you see river systems on this moon. You see something which looks like a lake. But this is not water. This is methane, fluid methane. And it basically was the first landing on a, in a world in the outer solar system. So NASA has not landed yet at this distance from the Earth. It was a European lander that touched down on this moon. You see here how, mm, the, how it looked like. This is a, a photo taken on the surface. You see here um, the, 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 the horizon distance. So this is 80 centimeters away from the camera. This is 2.4 meters. These stones that we see here, here in the natural color, are actually water ice. But at the very cold temperatures, this water ice is as hard as granite. Okay, and you probably have read in the past uh, couple of years a lot about Rosetta in the newspapers. Uh, you see it here again in our test center. So this is the actual pro uh, satellite, and you see here huge solar rays because it had to go very far from the Earth, so it needed to collect lots of light. In from one end to the spacecraft to the other, it's 32 meters. And it had to fly a very complicated orbit. So it was launched in 2004, and then had to fly by the Earth, sorry, the Earth, by Mars, 
again the Earth, one more time the Earth, until it got enough energy to get to the comet, which was 10 years later. And again, a year later then, it basically uh, ended the mission. This was a selfie taken by Rosetta when it passed by Mars. Another one when it arrived at the comet. Here, Rosetta is about 16 kilometers away from the, uh, from the comet, so the distance to Nova Gorica from here. This is how this comet uh, looks like. So it's about four kilometers in size. So it's comparable to the city of Rome. Uh, but of course, it's a 3D object, so it looks more impressive. And these are photographs you probably have seen in, in the news media of how this comet looks like. And in fact, it shows really very complex uh, topography. It, it shows uh, rather flat surfaces, it shows ravines, uh, it, all kind of geological structures can be seen here. Uh, what you should think, however, this is not as white as it appears here. In reality, this is a very dark object. So it's dark as dark asphalt. It's very dark. It's, it has a very low albedo. And it produced a lot of scientific data. For example, you see here the ratio of deuterium to normal uh, hydrogen. Deuterium is effectively a hydrogen, which is a proton in the, cent in the core of the atom, but there's also a neutron uh, with it. Normal water contains, for example, a certain percentage of deuterium as well, so we drink it every day. But there's a certain ratio of this a hydrogen to deuterium in our oceans on, on the Earth. And this is the measurement from Rosetta. So you show that it's a very different ratio, which means, again, that the water on the Earth probably did, did not come from comets. It's not understood yet where the water on the Earth came, because the Earth initially had, of course, a load of water, when it was created, but then this water actually evaporated into space and it had to be reacquired. And this is still not completely understood how that happened. And missions like Rosetta helps us to understand that. With Rosetta came also the first landing on a comet by mankind. And you see here, this is basically a washing machine sized um, apparatus, which in fact landed on uh, the comet, and of course, it was followed by news media with large attention. And you see here photographs taken from the orbiter of the lander. You see here enlarged, this is a small image here, it's enlarged. Next to it, you see here the, the lander flying down. You see at the minutes, five minutes later, it's already here. At five minutes or four minutes later, it's here already, and so on. And then finally, it touched down here. You see here the touchdown point marks of the landing gear. Unfortunately, the anchoring mechanism did not work. And so it basically just deflected. So the gravity field force is very small, but it, and it was coming in very slow, but it then basically jumped again. And in fact, uh, as uh, the project uh, manager, uh, Stefan Ullermetz, uh, said it on TV, that day, Europe has not landed on the comet. It actually has landed three times. And uh, it was only a year later, just one month before the mission had to be abandoned, that finally this uh, lander was found. You see here the Im an image of the surface, and you see here a funny structure, which in fact is enlarged here. And you see this is the lander. So we were very lucky to find it before we had to switch off the mission. Now, what we are talking about is basically exploring the planetary system. And we have here an image, uh, say, at a scale of one to a billion. At that scale, the sun is about one and a half meters in diameter, a sphere like that. The Earth is 13 millimeters. The distance from the Earth to the Sun at that scale is 150 meters. 
Jupiter is already the size of an orange at a distance of about 500 meters. Neptune, the end of the planetary system in terms of the, la the last planet, is three kilometers away. But the first star would be in the same scale, 40,000 kilometers away. So this gives us a little bit of an impression of how large the universe is. And in fact, we have one mission operating very nicely in space, and I think also here in Vipava and uh, in Nova Gorica, it's being studied here by Gaia. And this is a special mission which can measure the positions of stars on the sky at very high accuracy. And with this, you can study the motion of the stars and you can understand the dynamics of the galaxy, of our galaxy. It was made possible by using the same material again that we developed for Herschel, uh, the silicon carbide. And you see here the structure which holds the mirror systems which have to be extremely stable um, during the operation to be able to, to measure the accuracies that we need. Now this is one of the first overview photographs made of the sky, of the complete sky. Uh, in, in fact, you see here the Andromeda galaxy that we have seen before, right there. It's a small smudge here. Uh, you see here in the middle, effectively, our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And basically, in this photograph, you cannot see the individual stars. You just see a depiction of the density of stars as measured by Gaia. Effectively, uh, this is again Andromeda galaxy, but now shown in uh, visible light. Uh, the distance to this galaxy is two and a half million light years. So this is a million times further away than the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, roughly. So the 40,000 kilometers in our scale has to be multiplied by a million times to come to the distance to our next galaxy. And this is one galaxy in, 10, in 100 billion galaxies we know exist in the visible universe. So the diameter of this galaxy is, or this of the Andromeda galaxy, is about 250,000 years. That means that light needs 250,000 years to come from one end to the other. Now, to show uh, what actually how visible our human, uh, human activities on Earth are. Let's just imagine that this is our galaxy. In that case, this is about 100,000 light years. Then, the radio signals we are emitting from Earth since the last, say, 100 years have only traveled the distance between these two arrows. And that's it. So basically, if somebody is observing the Earth, with very sensitive radio receivers or television receivers, then they could see our Earth only if it's within a small sphere delimited by these two arrows. Anywhere else, we are just not existing yet on the Earth, uh, at least not with electronics, so we would not be detectable. This is just to give you an impression you know, on the habitability of the universe and the ability to detect uh, civilizations. So we can only see civilization if, I mean, if, if there was a civilization on another planet, then of course we could, with our radio telescopes, pick up their transmissions from television stations, which are very powerful radio transmitters. But we can only see it if we had enough time for these radio transmissions to reach our Earth. And so our impact on our galaxy, if this is our galaxy, this is shown to that scale, is only this tiny area here, which is about one thousandth of the diameter of our galaxy. And with this, I would like to end, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, talk. So. Uh, I would like to start a discussion. I don't know, maybe I should go first. I have many questions. Maybe uh, first one a bit provocative. 
Uh, I also hear it uh, sometimes. So what would you answer to someone asking you, why should we care about space? Why should we spend money for space explorations if we have so many problems on the Earth? Okay, there are quite a few answers I can give on this. Uh, there is, of course, one which is we know a lot more. I mean, we are a curious species. We would like to know what does it look like on Mars? Uh, what does it look like on Titan? Uh, how do, what is a black hole? These are questions which we would like to find answers to. And for that, we need instrumentation where we can gain a lot if we are in space. And it costs us only, say, one euro a year. Now, is that too much? I mean, how, what, what can you buy for one euro? Uh, but there's also so, an economic reason to do it. If we build these missions, like the silicon carbide you've seen before, this same material is now being used in the brakes of the highest performance cars. So if you're buying a Ferrari, you will get brakes made out of that material. Or if you're building very stable optics for metrology equipment, we buy, you know, Swiss, Swiss highest performance equipment, it will have silicon carbide structure inside. There are also new types of electronics, new types of building tanks, of, of building optics, and all kind of technologies that have been developed for these missions to be able to do what we need to do. And these technologies can be used on ground. The Norwegians have, for example, made a study recently uh, a few years ago, where they evaluated what gains it for them economically, just purely from the you know, bean counter's perspective, to spend money in ESA. And actually they found out that for each euro that the Norwegians spent in ESA, they got five euros back into their economy. So I think this is a pretty good investment, isn't it? So there are economic reasons to say to do it, and there are, say, scientific reasons, like we do culture, we, we make music, uh, we make paintings, and we enjoy them. So we enjoy also science. Yes, thank you. So what would be, uh, for example, what would you answer to someone saying, well, for Slov Slovenia is a small country, so we could in principle gain lots of this new knowledge, but, but just getting it from other countries, from ESA, from NASA. So why should we join ESA and spend our money on that? Um, by joining ESA, the member states basically get this money that they pay back. It's effectively a, a way of funding uh, high tech. Of basic, it's a way of advancing the knowledge in their own country. It is quite difficult for individual countries to know where to invest in the space segment. I think the countries are well aware of that they want to have a certain independence on, say, uh, navigation or even timekeeping. I mean, nowadays, clocks all rely on, on GPS system. Or we want to have better weather forecasts uh, because we want to understand natural weather phenomena in a better way to see to predict what could happen and prepare, for, for example, for a storm. A simple storm can cause much more damage than such programs cost over years. So it is also there a good investment to be able to observe the Earth. If we are measuring the warming of the Earth, we can take action today to prevent difficult times for our children and their children. If we don't ob observe the Earth to that precision that we can only do from space, then we just would not no notice the problem, but maybe this is not the best solution, because we can only react in time to, for example, lower the carbon dioxide emission uh, into the atmosphere. So there are a lot of practical reasons to do that, and there is the economic reason of actually being sure to be part of, uh, of the developments which take place anyway. It is a comparatively small development if you look, for example, in what is being spent in the automotive development. 
uh, just for example to bring up out a new model of the car. So you take the the, the Golf, VW Golf, next year's model. You spend one billion euros just to do that transition. If you pr bring out a new model, completely new model, you know, if you bring out the Fiesta, then that costs you a few billion euros. Electronics is a simple thing, similar thing. I mean, I mentioned that we are spinning in technology here to do the optics for this X-ray mission Athena. The electronics industry spends hundreds of billions per year in technology development. So it's just huge amounts in compared to what we're doing now. Anyway, I would like to note that the five billion is only a small fraction of what the Americans are paying. The Americans are paying about five to six times more per person for NASA than we are paying for ESA. And Slovenia at the moment, you saw, is paying only about a fifth of what the average, per, uh, average member state of the ESA pays. And so there, there are a lot of gains for Slovenia to join ESA and to participate in uh, its program. This would be definitely my view. At the moment, yeah. Slovenia is rather behind compared to the other European countries. Thank you. Perhaps we have some questions from the audience. Lahko tudi po slovensko vprašate, jaz lahko tudi po slovensko odgovarjam. Two questions. One, financial. Do you get any money directly from the European Commission or is just the budget covered by the member states? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, no, a part of this 5 point uh, something billion comes actually from the EU. The Galileo program effectively is paid by the, it's an EU program, but it's executed by the European Space Agency. The, it's our agency which has enough expertise to build this system. Uh, EU tried to do it on their own initially. This is actually what caused a few years of delay, but it didn't work out, and they decided then to give this contract effectively to ESA. But we get all the autonomy to decide what needs to be done technically. It is similar for telecom. Telecom is nowadays a commercial market. In fact, uh, basically we can have only our television channels uh, via satellite, etc., uh, made in Europe because we are developing the next generation, constantly developing the next generation uh, satellite systems for that. That is again done economically. That's basically, you know, member states, uh, television stations, etc., want to buy transmitters on, in orbit for a certain price. And this price goes down with time, capability goes up, and you have to have new technologies for that. Earth obs observation is very similar. This is a completely commercial market. Uh, so you have a huge number of, prod uh, of products uh, on the market which have to rely on uh, satellite technologies. Also there, there's a lot of uh, interest there, but basically of, of, of the, um, it's about 3 billion that is directly coming to ESA and the rest comes from the EU, roughly. And uh, next question, what will uh, replace Ariane for? Uh, yeah, Ariane um, will be replaced by another Ariane. <laughs> so we have the Ariane 5, which is our workhorse since uh, a number of years, and it will be replaced by the Ariane 6. So basically, we have uh, every few years, uh, every two or three years, a uh, meeting of the delegations of the member states on the level of the ministers of the country. So the, correspond the, the minister for economy, for example, or depending on the country where they allocate ESA. And they have the decision power to decide things like developing a new launcher. And so this was done already a few years ago. Europe decided in view also of the developments in the United States with the commercial developments, SpaceX, et cetera, that if we want to keep our position of leading the launcher market, then we need to have a new launcher. And we'll need to have it in a few years' time. So that means we have to start early enough, and we have started about two years ago uh, developing that launcher. And it will become operational within a few years. We'll have then also two versions of it so that we're more adaptable to 
uh, to the market, and they will be also more economically in terms of production. And also the way that it is implemented is much more in the economy, it's much more industrial than it was before. Thank you. <clears throat> more questions? Okay, here and then there. Thank you very much, sir. I try to listen very carefully if maybe uh, developing countries would be mentioned among the countries you know, that you mentioned while you were giving us this lecture. I just want to ask if maybe there is a kind of plan to involve other countries like people, I mean, from Africa in exploring a universe, just mm -hmm. to make sure they are no part yeah. of this uh, exploration. So. Yeah. Well, in fact, Africa is quite um, dynamic in this area. So in the past decade, past 10 years, a lot of African countries have actually established their own space agencies. In fact, I was a few years ago in a very large, uh, actually the most important uh, conference uh, for space developments, and it was in Africa. Um, because these countries profit even more from space than, say, not, uh, United States or Europe. We have a very dense infrastructure on ground, and this does not exist to the same level in Africa, and Africa is a huge continent. So in Africa, uh, telecommunication will move more to the use of space, and it is also important to monitor what is happening on ground, for example, agricultural use, deforestation, things like that, from space. So this was recognized by African countries, and many of them uh, are basically uh, increasing their space activities. So they are either building themselves, often together with uh, uh, European or American or Japanese partners, uh, spacecraft to, in fact, fulfill the needs they have, uh, specific, say, for Africa. So this is something that is, is happening to a large extent. Uh, also, Asian developing countries are catching up very quickly in, in the space segment. It's no longer the big boys game only, and it's everybody playing. Thank you. Another question? Uh, is it possible to go to the International Space Station or in the labs? Or is this any plan to...? You mean you would like to visit it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, in principle, yes. I mean, in fact, the Germans have just announced, I think, yesterday or today, that they have chosen two new female astronauts, because the Germans won't have a female astronaut now in space, and that means in the space station. Uh, so effectively, what you have to watch out is for calls for new for astronaut candidates, which in fact occur every few years. And then you are basically competing against typically a few thousand candidates which volunteer for this. And they are then selected in few steps. So you have to be, of course, physically fit. Uh, you have to bring in the right background. So natural sciences are often a very good thing, but it doesn't need to be. Um, or you are a fighter pilot, it also helps. But it is less important than it was in the past. In the past, you almost had to be a fighter pilot to be an astronaut. This is very different today. Uh, today, you know, you have often just a lot of different uh, expertises that you would like to have in space. So, in principle, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> what happened with uh, old satellites that are not uh, more in use? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a very good question as well. Um, in fact, the, the, the number of satellites in space increases with time because, uh, of course, satellites live typically for a number of years, a few years. So nowadays, they live longer and longer. So telecommunication satellites, for example, have a ex life expectancy of about 15 years. Uh, and then it depends on the orbit. So a telecommunication satellite or an Earth observation satellite is often in a very specific orbit, which means that the satellite stays on the same position on the sky as seen from Earth. That means in that orbit, it takes 24 hours to go once around the Earth. 
That means when the Earth turns, all the satellites follow, and it stays always at the same location. So therefore, for example, for Europe, you have satellites stationed over Europe, which is about 30,000 kilometers away from the Earth. P satellites, after they have, or before they finish their life, they must be able to remove themselves from that orbit. So they move to a different orbit, which they are not bothering anybody. Then we have, so and this is effectively kind of debris. They are dead satellites after a while, but we know their orbits, so they are not a threat. And they are limited in numbers. It is different closer to the Earth. So at an altitude of 500 kilometers up to a few thousand kilometers, satellites remain there, but they are, you cannot move them anywhere to be on a safe position because the space is much more limited than if you're further away from the Earth. And you have many more satellites in low Earth orbit. So for those, all satellites we build now in the science program, or actually any satellite that is built by ESA, is now built with the capability of, it's of removing itself from orbit. That means typically satellites that are close to the Earth are brought down, for example, to the Earth to burn up in the atmosphere. And that has to be done in a way that we are sure that it will not damage anybody. So we have to make sure that the satellites are built in a way that they break up during this penetration into the Earth's atmosphere in a way that they are small enough in par parts that you just burn up because they come in, come in at kilometers per second. It's a huge speed. So when they enter the atmosphere, they just glow and burn up in, into, into gas. If there are parts which has, have the chance to survive entry, then you have to be able to control this entry to be able to predict where it will impact the Earth. And so that you can, for example, direct it to impact somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, you can clear the area from all ships, all aviation, when it penetrates. As you can imagine, this is a costly operation. It is also costly in terms of designing the spacecraft, because they have to carry fuel, propellant, to be able to do that. But it is something that is being more and more uh, a concern. So our agency takes care of it at its root. It just ensures that no more uh, things like that happen. I mean, it means that, for example, if we have, for Athena, for example, we have a cover over the telescope, which we would like to eject, just throw away, once we are in space. We cannot do that, because this cover could come back and hit the Earth, or hit another satellite. So we are effectively forbidden by doing, to do that. So we have to design the spacecraft such that it just keeps that cover and just folds it over. But we have to carry a mechanism which will be reliable and will stay with that. And once we are done with the observation, because this will be, for example, Athena is in the so-called L2 orbit, so it's about 1.2 million kilometers from the Earth, that will be just sent away into deep orbit, which eventually will, for example, fall onto the Sun. So maybe you have to calculate the orbit for the future and make sure that for 100 years, nothing happens. <clears throat> what is more dangerous is, for example, old satellites, in the, particularly if they collide, then they generate debris, they break up, and then you have not only two satellites, but actually the two satellites which collided produce thousands of parts in space which have to be tracked individually by radars uh, from ground. And this is being done. Thank you. And then satellites have to actually change their orbit to avoid these. It's also our satellites all have to carry propellant to be able to avoid debris. They get a warning, maybe a day before, oh, there is something where you might hit next day. You have to change your orbit. So we command the spacecraft to change orbit to avoid this debris. Thank you. Any more questions? One more. Mon pakar po slovensko. 
Prosim. Zakaj je tako važno, da ima Evropa svoj navigacijski sistem? Ker zdaj ta argument deloh američani sklopijo svojega, mislim, tudi če bi ga hotli, verjetno imajo možnost tudi sklopiti Galileo pol. Ne, da je to je razlika, ker oni, GPS je en obrambni sistem, to je en del vojaški. In oni imajo tako rečen, to je zapravo signal je kodiran in ta kodo imajo zdaj samo tako programiran, da se lahko uporablja tudi brez, da se ta kod pozna. Zato je to čisto enostavno, da se to, one to zako zdelajo tudi. Recimo, če imajo napad, ki je v Siriji, tam selektivno, lahko tudi selektivno to ustavijo tam. Za Evropo je ta Galileo tudi pomemben, da lahko recimo se v bodočnost veliko denarja prišpara pri letalstvu. Evropa bi rada letela direktno od točke do točke. To danes ni mogoče. Danes letimo po radionavigaciji na zemlji, so VORs, pa take postaje, ki jih imamo posod razrešene. In pristanek je recimo tudi z napravami, ki so na letališču. Da bi lahko uporabljali satelitni sistem za to navigacijo, moramo imeti pa dost zaupanje, da ta sistem res funkcionira. In Galileo bo mo možnost, da bo sporočil recimo letalo, če je zdaj zanesljiv ali ne. To se sam sebe kontrolira in ta si ta informacija tudi dodaten doda. To GPS nima. In dodaten je pa tudi Galileo bolj točen v navigaciji kot pa GPS. Kot pa GPS, ja. Tudi Recimo, mi nismo edini, da en drug navigacijski sistem upravljamo. Rusi imajo GLONAS, kitajci svojega tudi upravljajo, so že bolj naprej kot mi. In to, da mislim, da v nosločno uporabljo, to bo tudi pomenil, da naša navigacija bo zmeraj bolj zanisljiva ratala, ker normalne navigacijske naprave, tudi za avtomobile pa tako naprej, bo uporabljal vse ti sisteme na enkrat. To se pravi, da imamo lik več satelitov na nebu, katere lahko uporabljamo. Je še en čist drug argument tudi, zakaj mi hočemo imeti naš lastni sistem. Za GPS ima naša industrija veliko neugodnost, ker te informacije čez ta sistem so znane amerikanskem firmem, ne pa evropejskem firmem. To se pravi, za nove produkte, za razvoj novek produktov, ki to uporabljajo to GPS, morate poznati te natančnosti. In pri Galileo, kot evropejski sistem, bo pa ta informacija na razpolago evropejskem firmem. Dobro, sam večina te GPS-a sprejemnikov je v telefonih danes. In vsi ti sprejemajo GPS-a, ne? Za take aplikacije to ima biti ne bo tako vpliv, ampak recimo, če hočete sodelovati pri razvoju te hardvere, ne, Moj gun modulček za navigacijo morate kupiti v Ameriki. Amerikanske firme. Je bolj limitiran ta možnost, ki jih imamo pojď za naš lastni razvoj. Ampak jaz bolj govorim za bolj profesionalno uporabo. To se pravi za recimo letalstvo, za druge precizne, recimo bančništvo. Uporablja čist točne ure, da lahko ve, kdaj je kakšna transakcija bila. To so vse GPS ure. To je najboljša sinkronizacija, ki imamo posod na razpolagi. Kar velik del proračuna gre za to. Ok, I think I suggest to conclude here the discussion, you can continue afterwards. Ok, thank you. Ok, thank you again for a very nice lecture. So let's thank the speaker again.